Noah screamed when I tried to put her shoes on. She pulled her arms out of her jacket. She ripped her hat off and threw it onto the ground. So instead, we sat in the mudroom, and I surrendered. We would stay there for as long as she wanted. If we didn't go to the park, fine. If she didn't want to go, instead, she wanted to sit on the ground and play with her shoes for the rest of the afternoon, fine. She tried on Mummy's sandal. She tried on Mummy's sneaker. She tried on Mummy's high heel. She took my shoe off and tried it on. She took her Velcro shoe and put it onto my toe. I lay on the ground. She sat in front of me. We ate Cheerios. She put them into my mouth. She opened her mouth wide in a way that meant I was to copy her. She looked inside my mouth to see that I'd ate the Cheerios she gave me. We drank out of her water bottle. She said, up, up, for me to take the top off. She played with the cap and wanted to put her hand in the water. We sat there for another 20 minutes until eventually she put her shoe on. She couldn't get it on right, so she looked up at me to help her. I adjusted her sock enough so that she could get her foot in. We strapped the Velcro across. She stood up and reached her arm out. I put it through the sleeve of her jacket and then her other arm. I put on her hat. She put her hand on her head. Hat, hat, she said. I put on my hat. Dada's hat and Nori's hat. Da, da, ma, 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 ma. Mama's working, Nori. Mama has to work. She was calm on the way to the playground. She found a stick on the ground. She took it and dug it into the dirt. She threw it at the swing set. She went and got it and dug it into the dirt again. I followed her, going up the steps and down the slide, back up the playground, down the other slide, up to the steering wheel where she could steer the entire playground like a ship. The antidepressants, it seemed like I was able to focus on them more, that I was able to enjoy myself a bit more. It seemed like it was good for her, for me, to be like this. Maybe, eventually, these drugs would turn my soul to mush. Maybe, long term, they would give me some kind of strange disease. Maybe, they would be fine. Maybe this book ends with me sitting on a bench with Nora, stoned in the autumn sun. She's eating a fruit bar. Her legs are kicking back and forth. We have found ourselves here together as father and daughter. I take care of her. She takes care of me. What I've realized is that this book, more than anything, is about fatherhood. In its beginning, in the beginning of its end. I was thinking about my dad, and that despite the death sentence that he'd received when I first began writing this book, that he is okay. He still lives each day in all of its ordinary and mundane glory. Every time I talk to him, he proudly tells me how many steps he took in the day, sometimes over 10,000. Lately, he goes from the house to the coffee shop. He goes all over the place looking at the construction sites in the neighborhood. He walks with his brother or my mom, or sometimes he walks on his own. It seems that's enough for him. His speech is more disconnected some days than others, but he can always find a way to communicate what he's trying to. Some days he doesn't sleep well, and he tells me he's a bit tired. He tells me it's because he gets to thinking about things. There was a line in the weekly newsletter from Nora's daycare. It wished everyone to have a meaningful and easy fast for Yom Kippur. This assumption that everyone was planning on fasting seemed funny to me, and the hope that it would be easy also seemed funny to me. Should we not want it to be difficult to really earn our atonement? Miriam and I talked about if we would fast or not. She hadn't done it the year before since she was breastfeeding Nora, but this year she planned to. She felt like it meant something to her, maybe for the sake of tradition more than anything else. 
I told her I didn't care about fasting. Maybe I would, but I didn't really feel the need to. Most years I didn't. If you look too closely at a person's religious beliefs or spiritual practices, it'd be foolish not to expect to find imperfection and hypocrisy. That is its nature. I have the impression that isn't necessarily a bad thing. There must be some kind of discrepancy, some leap required in order to make room for a person to have faith and to access whatever sense of spirituality they're able to. In order for it to work, it seems, it can't make perfect sense. You need to suspend your disbelief in order to transcend the obvious. A refusal to engage with ideas that you don't fully understand it's a very comfortable place for your ego to stay and feel like it's in control. And when your ego is in control, there isn't really much more to be gained. There's nowhere to go. You're probably already there by default. I'm not very good at all of this myself, and I don't really believe in much, but I like thinking about it. I went on the internet and typed in Yom Kippur. On this day, Jews do their utmost to repent, but if, by the end of the day, they have reached their limits of their ability and are still morally flawed, God extends them forgiveness and purification anyway. If I didn't fast then out of laziness or defiance or whatever it is, I suppose then God may not be able to do anything for me. It is good to be a bit superstitious. It shows the holes in your atheism. I read more about why we are meant to fast. In one approach, fasting replaces animal sacrifices. Fasting causes one's fat and blood to be diminished, just as the fat and blood of an animal sacrifice was burned on the altar. The fast is a form of sacrifice which can atone for sin like the temple sacrifices once did. I read about the scapegoat. When the scapegoat was selected on Yom Kippur to symbolically carry the people's sins to the desert, a crimson cord was tied around its horns. While the practical purpose of this cord was to distinguish the scapegoat from the goat which was to be slaughtered, it also symbolized the sin which the scapegoat was carrying away. Isaiah 118 promises that if the Jewish people repent, if their sins are like crimson, they shall become white as snow. According to tradition, in some years, the scapegoat's cord would miraculously turn white to indicate that the people's sins were forgiven and purification was achieved in that year. I thought about this diagnosis I'd been given. I went away. It was a perfect scapegoat at the root of all of my own sin. Persistent depression disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, polysubstance use disorder in remission, Cluster B traits, ADHD, RO, Autism Spectrum Disorder, RO, Bipolar 2 Disorder. When I think of Nora and how I might explain this to her one day, this diagnosis as a whole, I suppose I don't know what to say exactly. I sat with it and tried to come up with something. To tell her that each of us, no matter what our place in the world is, each of us has our own struggle, that there's no use in measuring one person's struggle against another's. It doesn't help ease anyone's suffering or help them overcome anything. That our struggles have a way of defining us, defining what we aim to overcome and the record of what we've overcome so far. What this diagnosis was, was a medical interpretation of my struggle. The use, defining it, was so that we could try to find a way to overcome it. As these antidepressants settle in, I can see how a part of that struggle has been lifted, and another part that remains. It's a part of me that feels like it's been dulled out, that I've lost the ability to feel things thoroughly, that I'm missing the truth of things without the fog and the sadness that I'm used to. I'm unsure what to make of it all. In the morning, Miriam was downstairs trying to dress Nora for synagogue. Nora was fussing with her leggings, trying to pull them off. She began to cry. She held on to the baby gate and wailed up the stairs. 
That is how it feels when you're young and you have to get dressed up to go to synagogue. It's its own special form of torture. Miriam was getting cranky having skipped breakfast. I didn't eat either, but I still wasn't sure if I was going to go the whole day. I'd already drank two cups of coffee, so technically I'd already blown it. In the car we talked about how we were committing a double sin by driving, it being both Yom Kippur and Shabbat. Miriam said the point wasn't following the rules, it was about following the tradition she grew up with. She said she didn't care if I fasted or not. We found a good parking spot around the corner from the synagogue. Did you remember the tickets? She asked. No, it didn't even cross my mind. Well then, I'll just show them off my phone. They said not to. Well, they're there, so... When we got to the synagogue, the security guard looked through our stroller and through our diaper bag. Another man asked us for our tickets. I took out my phone and showed him. And in that moment, I realized the reason we weren't supposed to do so is because you aren't supposed to use your phone on Yom Kippur or on Shabbat. And now, the good Jews in the line, having involuntarily glared at my phone, now had more to repent. We went in and found some open chairs. The rabbi stood at the front of the room, leading the prayers. I held Nora on my lap. She tried to climb onto the chairs in front of us. She crawled from my lap to Miriam's. I might have to get a talus one day, I whispered to Miriam. You can have mine. It's a boy's one. Where is it? In the garage, she said. I smiled. What? Nothing. Miriam kept trying to wipe the snot that had dried under Nora's nose. I remembered how it felt when my mom used to do that to me when I was a kid at synagogue. Nora became more and more fussy, so Miriam took her to go walk around. I sat in the chair and followed along in the book. I kept noticing how most people were wearing sneakers, and I remembered how you weren't supposed to wear leather shoes on Yom Kippur. I looked at my shoes, the grain of the leather. I looked up at the duct in the ceiling. We stood up for some prayers and sat down for others. That is how it is to be in synagogue. You stand, and then you sit, and then you stand, and then you sit again. They took the Torah from the ark and began walking it around the room. People kissed their books and then touched them to the Torah as it passed. I didn't want to kiss the book. I would starve myself for the day because that's what Miriam did, but I didn't want to kiss the book. I went and put the book back on the table where I'd found it and went off to find where Miriam and Nora went. <clears throat>